<laughs> okay, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. We're really excited to share what we are doing. So I just wanna make sure you're in the right place. Like they say that you're in the right flight. This is Calling All Coaches. And what our agenda today, what we're gonna talk about and share with you is who are the coaches that are out there supporting caregivers, child care providers? What kind of coaching do we offer and share? What does business coaching look like in different communities? What we're doing in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Maryland, and in Philadelphia today? How our programs differ from each other, how they are alike, the challenges and the successes that we have. And of course, we're gonna have a little exercise for everybody to share. So we really wanna learn from you as we share what we are doing too, so we can always improve what we are doing. Right now, I am going to introduce our panel members. I'm gonna introduce myself last. So I'm gonna start with Kim. Kim Farmer. She is an early learning specialist and she works for First Up Champions for Early Education. Kim has been in the field of education for over 30 years. So she's my hat off to you. She has been employed at First Up for nine years. Her expertise and love is working with directors and teachers in guiding them through to develop, maintain, and sustain high quality in early care and education. Kim's passion is children and families with the focus of parents being true advocates for their children's growth and development. Thank you, Kim. Karen, Karen Eisenhuth. <laughs> she is an early childhood business coordinator for the Maryland Family Network. And for those who attended the marketing session yesterday, that was in Laura's and your team. Correct, yes. Karen has been everywhere. <laughs> this is a woman that can't stop doing things. And She's been an educator, a coach, a small business owner for 24 years. She actually opened her own childcare and was there for 16 years while having another business on the side because she was, I don't know what she, why, Crazy. but she did. Crazy. <laughs> yes. Successfully there. And then she was elected to become a preschool teacher. Oh, she elected to become a preschool teacher and curriculum mentor and join forces with a large child care center in her area. She was actually promoted to assistant director and then director of the year for her leadership and tenacity and became later the school director of one of the largest centers within that corporate structure. So in a way you were in a for-profit kind of world and then Correct. went into the nonprofit world. Correct. She is currently the Early Childhood Business Coordinator for Maryland Family Network, a nonprofit organization that you will hear more about when, she's, when she shares with us. And in addition to her work, she is president of the Hartford County Directors Association, a chapter of the Maryland State Child Care Association. She is passionate about early childhood education, seeks to ensure that children, family, and educators have equal access to high quality care and that all child care providers are viewed as, prof as the professionals that they are. Thank you. And then it's me. My name is Maria Carlota Palacios and I am a clinical social worker who has been in social work for many, many years. And uh, in my 30 years of, gosh, not, maybe not 30 years, but it looks like a long time. I have gone from maternal health to school social work, to community research, to coalition building, to changing systems or addressing systems to change them for the better. I have uh, had my own private practice for many, many years. Then I went into corporate America for 14 years. And in 2019, I left corporate America and became the director of Tulsa Educare Early Learning Works. 
And with that, I'm here, I'm very excited. This is my first early childhood education related conference. And uh, I'm learning a lot. And my job has become even more fun and more challenging after today. So I'm going to be the first one to present. And then we will, each of us will present and then we'll have an opportunity to share, have a conversation and have a little exercise that we have for you. Ready. Okay. Um, no. Uh, no. 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 It's supposed to be this. And Technology the never really works <laughs> the way that we want it to work. <laughs> <laughs> but it shouldn't be. Yeah, but we shouldn't have to. Okay, now, now it works. Yeah. So I am early learning works with, but, but wait. <laughs> okay. But I am part of a bigger, bigger thing. We are not an independent, kind of semi-independent autonomous organization, but we are under the umbrella of the Educare Learning Network. And specifically in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we have four Educare schools. If you're not familiar with the Educare schools, they are the highest quality early learning education that a child can possibly have and under the early head start subsidies we kids that are eligible are kids who are either in foster care regardless of income and uh, special needs and those who are subsidized by the their state department of human services in this case for us so under that then there is the Tulsa Educare with four schools we have the most schools in the in the United States we have four and everybody else has one maybe two and in part is because this particular cause or mission or effort is very big in Tulsa Oklahoma because we have people who care so much about early childhood education that believe it or not Oklahoma has become number one or two in early childhood education efforts. You know, we, we always are the last in everything, but that <laughs> is one huge. So this is what the Educare schools provide. And it's a whole support of the child with the family, family advocates. And then because they provide such an amazing system around the child to make sure that they succeed into their elementary world, they, before I came in, conceived the idea of how do we export the amazing things that are happening in the schools into the Tulsa community and then share in that same fashion and, and adapt to, to the different programs that are not necessarily in the schools. So then Early Learning Works was born two years ago. This is a new program. This is, has been around for only two years this month. So it is an amazing thing that I get to be part of it because they told me we have this idea, we have this concept that we want to do, and we need someone to develop it, envision it, and make it happen. So I appeared and was hired <laughs> to do this and in a challenging world because I started my job literally when the United States was shut down or the world really. So everything we did was virtually. But then this is our mission. I'm not going to read every single word, but the difference between the Tulsa Educare schools and us is that we go through age eight and they stop at age four. We have the ability then to expand what we have learned through early childhood up to the second or third grade, depending on the age of the children. And we meaningfully, because it's very close work with child care providers, licensed and not licensed, and then we'll talk about that, and faith-based and community organizations in Tulsa providing all kinds of programming. And here, this is some of the things that we provide. Early Learning Works 
everything we provide in our programming, we call it, this is annoying, world of learning. It's like the world. To me, we are citizens of the world. So everything we do and how we share our information, how we do workshops for parents is to help them see beyond just their own community to, to make sure that at least we bring some worldly uh, attitude so we can not only take care of the child, but each other in our community. So a lot of these programs that we see here, I'm only gonna talk about the learning getaways today. And the learning getaways is focused on childcare homes and small centers if, if they want to participate, but mainly we focus on homes because we know that they have less resources that centers do. And we can only do so much. We can only do what we can do and we don't want to do things half-assed. We wanna do and focus on the two or three things that we can do well. So this particular learning getaway was conceived because we were thinking, okay, childcare providers are ready for technology. We need to get together and figure out which one we're gonna buy and how we're gonna do it. And then we started with Amy Friedlander, assessing, discovering, listening, asking with my team who take all the credit for the work that we are doing to find out, okay, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna take off and do it? And then we realized, oh my gosh, when we were doing the PPP loans, the protective, Paycheck Protection Program Loans. Hi, I'm saying I'm not doing acronyms, okay. And then we were doing the American Rescue Plan, helping childcare providers apply and give them coaching. We did, we started the two years ago doing virtual professional development. It works well because we have about a hundred every month doing their professional development in different, different topics. But then we thought, oh my gosh, we have to do much more, much more intense work. Then after all that, we said, we are not ready for technology. No, no way. They can't, they, sometimes they don't even file taxes or the record keeping is mediocre at best. So we thought, no, we have to start from where they are. And then later, if we get them from A to B, then we can see who would be ready and committed to try technology. So the learning getaways is a two hour professional development session. See, okay, Amy, this is annoying. <laughs> Wait, okay, stay there. Okay, I think, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it is a nine month long, two hour, professional development where we incorporate the lecture at the beginning of those two hours. And then we do from training to implementation. Then we do what we call the small coaching circles where we have them do activities, hands-on activities. I'm sorry, I was just trying to fix it for you. Mm -hmm. It is the right slide. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank I'm you. Changing everyone. I'm so sorry. No, you can't. You're fine. You're I'll fine. It's been there you go. Okay. Time. So, so be, when they get to our office, actually, when I started our early learning works, I was given an 8,000 square feet new building, new, new. I had to equip it, furnish it, buy office supplies. Oh, that was so much fun to do all that was perfect. So that building has training rooms. It actually has an educational room where you actually can do coaching. You can do, but we haven't done it because of COVID, but we, we have an observation room where we can actually guide the, the, either the teacher or the parent through, through ways of doing positive discipline and all conscious discipline and different, different approaches. Okay, it's happening again, and yeah, the, they come every month. It's an RSVP, 15 people max, because we notice that if we expand it too much, too many people, too many conversations, and we need to kind of keep it focused and pay attention. And then they have, we offer them a meal, 
Then we offer them a, an educational toy, uh, books, and sometimes we offer them a gift card or something. And the, and the way we call it learning getaways is because it's get away from it all, come to us, have fun, network, share a meal, learn while you have fun, learn while you do your exercises that actually can take you to improve your business practices. That has been so significant for us because we have seen the need and we actually are becoming very popular because of the way that we approach these learning opportunities because it's fun, it's not boring, is actually my team just doing very specific things that they need. And so far it's been very, very successful for us. And then after that, we do coaching circles where we actually have times where they can come in, make an appointment, and we can actually do the coaching with them on a particular issue that they may have. And we don't charge for this program. It's all free for them, but we do expect commitment when they say they're coming. We expect them to come, or at least we say, okay, commitment is important to us. And if you are SVP, that means you commit to come because your spot could be taken by somebody else. That has been a little bit of an issue for us because sometimes I know things happen, life happens, but that's a sign of professionalism. And if we're gonna be professionals, you need to do what you say you're gonna do. That is part of business acumen. So that is also part of what we do, the business acumen and really hammer the, the concept or the idea or the reality that they are also professionals and entrepreneurs. These are some of the topics that we're going to, that we have been sharing with them. And again, we have all these tools. We use a lot of Tom Copeland stuff and Shared Services of Oklahoma is a hub. It's a web platform where there are tons and tons of tools that you can download and use with your child care providers in the individual coaching, group coaching, that have been very useful that they can use themselves. And we always give them the ability to access it, to use it. But you know, we know how busy the child care providers are all day long. We try to make it as easy as possible, but also help them. What we want to see is that at the end of this leadership series and this business series, that we identify a few people who might be ready for automation at that point, and then modify our leadership series as we need to, to address the needs that we see in the community. That has been a successful one. And we are we designed our own based on the information. You know, there is a lot of research out there. There is a lot of stuff going on. Tom Copeland provides all kinds of information. So all we do is put it together in a succinct way that it's easy to share, easy to train on, and my staff can study it and then present it to everybody. One minute? Two minutes. Two minutes, <laughs> which, okay. So I have two more minutes, which is, mm, in addition to that program, and I'm just going to talk real quickly about that, is we have a program that we partner with Phoenix, Arizona, with a group of folks in Candlin in Phoenix, Arizona, called Friends, Family, and Neighbors. And these are supports for caregivers who are not licensed. And we have actually graduated the first cohort last night. We had 13 of them, and we take them through the whole process of routines and lesson planning and space and, and conscious discipline, safety, literally safety from what to put in a crib and what should not go in a crib, the, the how to make sure the kitchen has all the safety features so the child, whatever, the grandmother, the aunt, the, the mom taking care of somebody else's kid can actually at least have that information and learn that through simple things, you can always stimulate the brain of the child, you can keep the child safe, and we have gone through, and we also give them like a little library, we give them a, what we call a brain box, which is full of books and educational toys that we put together for them, and made a huge party last night. I wasn't there, but 
Yeah, so that has been a very successful one. We'll, we'll kick off the next one in the fall. And I am going to give it to Karen to share with us what she has to say. And hopefully, Karen, you won't suffer from PowerPoint death. <laughs> Me and technology aren't friends, so if I have like a panic attack, just pick me up off the floor. Um, I know, I hate this one. I hate using a microphone. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Maria introduced me, my name is Karen Ismuth, and I'm the Early Childhood Business Coordinator for Maryland Family Network. I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm actually a little anxious about it. There are so many of you in this room <laughs> and online, um, but I am super excited to have conversations with you and just really learn what you guys are doing about coaching and talk to you about what Maryland Family Network is doing with coaching um, on a couple of programs that we are initiating in Maryland. Um, so Maria gave you a <laughs> brief, <laughs> a brief bio of what um, I do, but one of the biggest things um, that I love to do was coaching, whether it was coaching youth or high school sports, coaching teachers, and now coaching coaches. I've always learned something so valuable with each group that you've coached. But the one thing that holds true, depending, no matter what environment you're in, is that connection and building relationships is truly the heart of coaching. Maryland Family Network is a nonprofit, like I had said, whose focus is on supporting and advocating for children, families, and child care professionals in a variety of different settings. Amongst other things, we lead multiple statewide projects that include um, family support centers and child care resource and referral networks. The program that I'm going to be talking to you today is housed under the um, Child Care Resource Network. In 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, Maryland Family Network launched a shared service pilot, and we had big, big plans for the pilot. This program was designed to have two different pillars, um, the pedagogical leadership, which included child development, um, classroom coaching, instructional leadership, um, teacher support and credentialing, ECMH supports, um, improvements and quality rating support, um, and family support. And then the business leadership, which, um, you know, Amy introduced us to the Iron Triangle, um, and we worked on marketing support, website development, enrollment, accounting, tax prep, budget, and retirement planning. During that time, we found that child care providers, just like all of you, um, were not bouncing back as quickly as center-based care. And frankly, they just did not have the support um, and resources that a center, center would have. Our goal was to empower um, the family child care providers to be able to focus their attention on creating a solid foundation for their business, as we believe that their quality initiatives would only improve by the improvement of their business focus. We wanted to, the goals of the program were we wanted to increase financial sustainability, increase their revenue, decrease the amount of, woo, there it goes. There we go. Decrease the amount of time spent on business tasks, increase their QRS rating, which we call Maryland Excels, increase access to business and pedagogical expertise. You good? You can steal it. Hello again, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's on the pile. Okay. You're clicking. Okay. So you can try with that. Yeah, we're going to take this back away to the. Okay. So, how did we do it? Um, our program began with 60 family child care providers housed in three different jurisdictions in Maryland under the direction of three business coaches. The providers within this cohort were both English and Spanish speaking, and two of our business coaches were English speaking and one of our um, coaches was bilingual. And we also had um, contracted with a interpreter, um, interpretation service who is live on every single professional development that we have giving live interpretation. 
the three services that we provided in that cohort were professional development, um, business training and coaching, and automation. <laughs> We offered monthly professional development training that focused on key performance indicators such as the iron triangle, marketing, time space percentage, record keeping, contracts, taxes, and retirement planning. And as we were going through the project, the state rolled out its first rounds of grant funding. So we also helped providers apply for those grants and then ultimately track those grants. And the professional development trainings were held as one big cohort. So all three jurisdictions together. In addition to the monthly professional development, our providers met individually as counties, or um, we also have Baltimore City, so as the city. Our providers met individually, and we called them peer connects. And during these sessions, led by our business coaches, um, they would discuss the topics in depth, like really go in depth to the meat of that, but they would also be able to share problems they were having and come up with solutions together um, as a network. Our business coaches also provided one-on-one -on -one coaching support. Um, and lastly, we offered the use of a CCMS platform. Ironically, we launched the CCMS platform first um, and we will be doing things a lot differently next time. <laughs> One of the most important pieces within our program was the connection piece, as I said before. And it was the priority of our business coaches to ensure that relationships were built and trust was imperative. Um, we wanted the providers to be able to buy in, right? And to learn from them. So the roles of our business coaches were to provide business support and resources, organize the peer connect meetings, facilitate small group discussions during the business training series and assist with the onboarding support and troubleshooting of the CCMS service. And really, they were the advocates for the family child care providers themselves. They were there to inform us, the intermediary, of what needed to be done, what the um, providers were struggling with, what we needed to change, and kind of move in flex as we um, went through the program. However, with any program, we found some obstacles along the way. In relationship to the topic coaching, one of ours was that this program was developed and then midway through personnel changed. Um, I began with MFN and half, halfway through this project. What does that have to do with coaching? Well, as I said, relationships are so important. So somebody coming in midway through, having to learn the program, really get to know the business coaches and build relationships with them and really hear them, as well as get to know all 60 providers, right? Um, I had to be able to see the program through my business coach's eyes. I had to see the program through my direct supervisor's eyes, my executive director's eyes, and the provider's eyes. It is also important to note that our business coaches within this project were not permanent fixtures. They were not permanent, they were not supposed to be the permanent business coaches. We were in the process of hiring for those positions. And our business coaches are hired and supervised by the child care resource networks in which they come from. So we have eight different child care resource networks in Maryland um, that we got kind of govern, we oversee. Um, and those three wonderful women were the um, employees of those organizations. Another obstacle was the uncertainty. This was a pilot program. So the goals and direction could, could and did absolutely shift while in the process of going through the work. As my amazing supervisor, Lacey would say, we were building the ship as we flew it. <laughs> Quite literally. With all that said, and as I quoted above, obstacles are things a person sees when he takes his eyes off the goal. Our goal, was focused on um, the needs of our childcare providers, right? And one of those lessons that we learned that I wanted to share with you is that since we focused on the childcare professionals, we did not focus on what the business coaches needed. And that is one thing that we are gonna be changing um, as we reflect on this pilot. So let me ask you, what does a business coach need in order to be an effective coach? Yeah. Lived experience. 
lived experience. Absolutely. No takers. It's Wednesday. It's the last day. Yes. Some relationship with the people that are A relationship with the people that they're coaching. Yes, ma'am. Patience, persistence. Patience, persistence, tenacity, right? Technical knowledge about the content. Exactly. Technical knowledge about the content. Absolutely. Now flip the script. How would a coach answer that question? What would a coach say he or she needed? What did you say? Technical skills. Now, are you referring to technical skills regarding automation all and CCMS? It. All of it. Yeah. Any question that came to them. Any question they came. So they were the subject matter expert or know where to find the resources to get the answer, right? Yes, ma'am. Resources. Know the resources. So what did we do? We asked our business coaches what they needed. And we are currently in the process of debrief. We call it debriefing. So we're currently in the process of debriefing so that we can plan our next cohort of the boost program. And at the end goal, or at the, at the end of us asking what the business coaches needed, they said that it was knowledge about the end goal, right? They needed to know where we were heading. There's a big picture, right? What was the end goal? They needed to know the expectations, both as their, both for their providers and as for themselves, right? What is expected of me? And um, I believe we also needed to focus on the training and skill. We have two different types of business coaches, or at least Maryland Family Network does. We have the early child care professionals that have to receive that business training, right? And then we have the business trained coaches that really need to understand what a family child care is supposed to do and what early childhood education is supposed to look like. Like how do we drive quality? So those are two different things all happening simultaneously. And further is to speak and know a common language. What are we teaching? What is the content we're teaching? And are we all using the same terms so that we are being a unified front? And lastly, they needed support and feedback. So I'll leave you, I didn't move the slide, I'm sorry guys. There you go, it's all there. <laughs> um, so I'll leave you with this quote, quotes are my favorite. Coaching is unlocking a person's potential to maximize their growth. Our coaches are truly the frontline support for these family child care providers. They work hand in hand with you and they work hand in hand with your providers. And they are, they are truly the most valuable members of this group besides the provider. Thank you guys. I want to ask a question that came in on the chat, which was about the challenges that you experienced having coaches being hired by different organizations and, you know, the fact that not only are they employed by three different organizations, but that none of those organizations are yours. So you are the coach of the coaches and not the direct supervisor of the coaches. Correct. Um, which is why I said it was an obstacle. However, while it is an obstacle and we have to keep what they do in focus, right? So our coaches are not only coaching for the programs that I coordinate, right? They are coaching for the hundreds of providers in their city or county. And they have you know, a list of who they need to work with and who they don't need to work with. And our boost participants are only a very small portion of that, 60 providers, and it's broken down into each county. Um, so one of the biggest things that we do is communication, right? We meet monthly, every other week on different topics. We are constantly communicating with each other. Um, I do an end of the week follow-up, you know, after I read the dashboard of our CCMS service or our CCMS system, um, I'll do like a follow-up of what I'm noticing, the trends and after reading the data and just really talk about what's coming next, what we're about to do, and then really ask them um, how I can help them. So it is really just about communication, Amy. 
You didn't get any questions. Yeah, but I just want to close with this because it's very specific to Karen's piece, which is about recruitment of providers to the project. Because, you know, in speaking to the fact that there is broader business coaching in the county as a whole, then someone on Zoom asked, well, then how are how are folks finding your project and coming to Maryland Boost? So we developed a website um, and we did some very active recruitment and marketing. Um, and it was launched on Maryland Family Network. It was also launched through the Maryland Department of Education, who we work in direct partnership with them. Um, they have a Tuesday tidbits that comes out monthly and all the child care um, providers in the entire state receive that if they have applied to receive that. And we are really close with our child care resource um, and referral networks. We meet with them. We meet with the program directors and the program managers monthly as well. So we, we just actively recruit for each other and we, we share the program with each other. We had over 150 providers um, apply for this program. We have current providers who are on wait list for the next program. Um, and we will probably only accept 60 for the next one as well. You're welcome. I thought they would talk for longer and I could just show up. Um, and Maria asked, was I ready? And I said, no. And I said, if they could just keep it on, I could just, you know, just look good That's <laughs> and Hi. she does look good <laughs> i'm kim farmer i'm from philadelphia glad to see my colleagues from philly here i feel so good i am an early learning specialist with first up champions for early education um and with an equip initiative which was formerly our success by six initiative and EQUIP stands for the Early Education Improvement Program Initiative, which is funded by the William Penn um, Foundation. What we do is support centers in our QRS system to move from our, our STAR system, one through four. We um, select STAR two programs to move up the ladder from three to four. That is my job um, as an early learning specialist. Yep. And so who is First Up? We're a nonprofit organization. We work with educators in the Philadelphia region. We also provide professional development training, as you see, best in class. And also we advocate for an influence public policy as well. And that is a list of everything that we do that I won't share. But what I do want to share is how I got to be part of this business integration, I think that's the next slide, that Amy so nicely shared in the, the plenary. So I was told by my manager that it was something I was interested in, but <laughs> and I have a memory, I have a memory like a goldfish, but after researching recently a memory of a goldfish, I can no longer take that claim. So I'm Dory in Finding Nemo, ooh, <laughs> sparkles. So evidently that this must have intrigued me. I don't know how, why, what, but since being here, boy, have I learned so much. I have learned how to reframe my discussion with the providers that I work with to ask them, how did you get into the business of early education? That has sparked phenomenal conversation, particularly recently, Amy would be so proud of me and so will Mary, that I learned so much from this one provider about how she got into the ECE business, all about her books, stuff I don't even want to know. But I, I learned it from her. So what our agency did was partner with um, PHMC and the coaches, my coaches that I work with, in learning how to utilize the toolkit in the program assessment tool and the business administration tool. So we have trainings monthly, I think, just to, to become comfortable with 
having the conversation. As Amy highlighted in the plenary, it it been some pushback, but I believe my coworkers are being really receptive to be able to have the conversation. No, I don't know all those acronyms, them CMS, and I don't CCMS. know those two. <laughs> I don't know those. But I've become very comfortable with now asking the questions, um, finding out how they can be more sustainable in early care and education and really connecting the pedagogical along with the business and letting them see that is high quality. I have come to learn and work with providers who have moved up the QRS system to, to come to learn because of lack of funding, they no longer are open. And I reflect on what could I have done to help them to improve that. And being part of this business integration piece has allowed me to reframe my questioning rethink a whole lot and not be afraid so much to have that discussion. So that is part of what we do. Next slide, I think. So part of the task with the, the PD that we have with the um, business integration is we look at all the pedagogical expertise. That's what I know. I live, breathe, and sleep that. So much so that I have trained my husband when driving past a playground to let him find out if it's safe or not. He can tell me. He, he knows all the acronyms in ECE. I live and breathe early care and education. What I wasn't familiar with was the business piece. And as a coach and, and working along side by side with my colleagues, learning how to specifically ask those questions and not just being able to tell them, okay, this is a resource, this is where you go, but to be able to learn with them. So the language that I use when I work with my providers is we, our, and us. I'm going for this ride with you because I'm learning with you. So with that, learning all of those pieces, really fine tuning it to help them meet their needs specifically. It's not a one size fit all with all of my providers, but with the help of the training, I am able to have those conversations um, without nervously saying, oh, you know, you can go to this training, sign up for this training. <laughs> no, to be able to have the conversation and see, is it, is it worth their while to go to the training? Because that may be their expertise already. So why send them somewhere to something they are already familiar with? So that's what I have learned to do through that. Next slide. And so in that, what I've learned along with the providers is all of that information. Usually we, I would say it would be a lack of interest in the business issues, but in having those conversations, I found that not to be true. Also um, the provider's expertise um, with business issues there are a few, but in my conversations with my providers, that's not true. They, they just need someone to help them juggle all of those pieces. Lack of automation, if you have a phone and a, a computer, you just need a little more assistance. I've learned that too. The business organization systems, their experience in working with efficient and effective um, places of business. I've learned so much while being here, I'll be able to share that with them. Also understanding um, e the ECE business model among accountants and taxpayers. We are a unique people. And I've learned that from um, the training I attended or the session I attended yesterday. Um, she's sitting in the back where she says she's the workforce behind the workforce. I'm taking that back to Philly. I'm taking that back. We are so unique because no one understands us. Even in if taking college courses, um, if some professors don't understand the world of early care and education at all, we find ourselves ending up teaching the professors. So with that piece, I'm, I'm learning the language, I'm learning to become comfortable and also not just um, being lim um, limited coach expertise, but to add to my toolkit to really have that discussion with that. So not only that I could learn that, but also work a lot um, along someone who has that experience to be able to have those um, that deep conversation. Next slide. 
So how the challenges have impacted, we know everywhere there's high staff turnover, vacant staffing positions, of course, poor compensation, a low profit margin, reduced um, capacity and wait lists, limited investments, IRS audits, l &I, so on and so on and so on. So to be able to kind of pull that all together again, and, and let's take a look. I've learned in one of the trainings, don't write off everything. That's one thing I'm gonna take back when I go home. Um, to be able to do that as well, to let the owner or provider, look, pay yourself, you are worth it, pay yourself first, and also help your teachers to learn to invest in themselves by putting something aside for yourself, so when you retire, you do have a nest egg um, to be able to do that, so I have been able to comfortably be able to have these conversations. Next slide. And so taking a look at the current landscape, we see it's real spotty, but being able to bring all of that together with the business leadership roles, the responsibility, really having clear job descriptions um, to be able to support what jobs that um, the provide or the teachers will be able to do, learning how to write documents um, and being able to implement those and learn and not being afraid of the metrics. Of, of such and being able to make money and learning not to say we did not, I learned that from you, my dear sister girl in the back, that we did not come into this business not to make money, but yes, we did. We came to make money and that's, that's what we're going to do and not to see ourselves as babysitters, but educators that we do in the beginning and help others recognize, not just in here, in this place, but around the world that in the beginning, we provide the resources for children to become successful. We understand brain development. We understand developmentally appropriate practices. Is that it? Is that it? <laughs> oh. And this um, part of the integration piece is that we do have a PD series monthly, our community of practice, and also we do resource sharing as well. Um, is, and we're going to put our heads together. So thank you for <laughs> taking the time to listen to me. This is, so we have an activity for our participants. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you sure can. I'm just curious. I think one thing that like, there's so many great like coaching programs and opportunities out there for people, um, but often the cost is more than an individual provider can pay themselves for like the quality of the coaching they're receiving. So can I ask for each of your projects, like who's paying for that coaching? Who's funding it? And sort of how did you make those relationships and, and get that money? So part of can I excuse me a second? It's really frustrating for the folks on Zoom right. when okay. they can't hear the yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm just curious, you sort of have these uh, amazing programs, but obviously you're paying your coach as well too. And so the cost is more than often individual providers can take on into their own budgets. So I'm curious about what sort of funding partnerships you've made, like where the money for these coaching programs is coming from, and also how you made those connections and, and sort of got that investment into these projects. So I can speak for my agency for first up. As I mentioned before, we do multiple things. We're a, we're a very small agency. So we do multiple things and being a nonprofit, it's, it's, we're a grant assistant through the William Penn Foundation. So being part of that coaching piece, um, we've partnered with other agencies for us to enhance our learning. So those providers that come into the equipped initiative, they pay for nothing. They pay for nothing. What they do receive is part of the coaching is what we call a PIF fund, a program improvement fund in which um, they can buy materials. Um, if they want to buy um, software for their, their business or whatever, they can add to that. Teachers can get training. Um, as a matter of fact, they don't even have to pay for the training because since they're in the equipped initiative, all of that comes free once they are accepted into the initiative. So it's well packaged um, and we are intensely trained or we come with um, much experience. Um, I've been doing this 
I'm 16, but even though I've been doing this for 30 years or more, um, we come with like very much experience with that and different levels of experience as we learned in the, um, the plenary where the gentleman mentioned that, that everybody has come with a little something. So we're able to do it. Do it that way. I would say, uh, Maria, one thing, since this is specific to a Philadelphia project that I've been involved in too, and Mary, you want to raise your hand. We're, we're also part of that coaching integration project. So it's, it is interesting. There are two groups of coaches. Kim is works for first up with the equip group, which is, you know, that's through a nonprofit and it's really to enhance quality efforts and funded through two large charitable um, organizations. Um, but the other group of coaches that are a part of this coaching integration project are all fully publicly funded. They are part of the our state quality rating and improvement system. So it is interesting that while the outside support that really is allowing this coaching integration is um, private, there are public, you know, public dollars in it. And I would also step back one big step to say that build, as I understand it, I was not intimately involved in this, but there was, uh, you know, somebody in Philadelphia access build to do a study and they came in and spoke and that's publicly available. Harriet Dichter was the primary author and, and they spoke to a lot of providers in the Philadelphia community that expressed a lot of frustration at the all the many, many consultants and experts and coaches. We also have, uh, you know, a state pre-K program that has its own set of coaches. We have a local Philly pre-K program that has its own coaches. Of course, if you're a Head Start grantee, et cetera. So providers spoke very loudly about their frustration at the many, many coaches. And we had this very professional report and um, the foundations that have care a lot about uh, kids in Philadelphia said, we don't want to torment our providers. We want to listen to what they've said. And we want to try to see if we can help move towards more integrated coaching. So there was the groundwork had been set, I would suggest. I don't know if you agree, Kim. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, we, look, we work alongside with them, along with the other initiatives. We kind of take a step back. Um, because their focus is usually more so on the education piece. But now having this business piece, I think as for me as a coach, that that just makes it so much better. Um, and not just about my own finances, but be able to talk with others about it too. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, in our program, the boost program specifically is um privately funded by a um, grant. Um, and then we have other programs that are funded, either they're legislative back, so they're funded by the Maryland Department of Education or ARPA or something else. Um, our boost participants pay nothing. So we, we have purchased the licenses for their childcare management software. They receive monthly professional development and one-on-one -on -one coach one -on -one coaching, and then their peer connects all free. And in our case, we are fully funded by the George Kaiser Family Foundation in Tulsa through a program called Birth Through Eight Strategies for Tulsa. So we are pretty much provide everything free and with great incentives and we have the liberty and the ability to do that, which is really a blessing, sometimes a little bit of a curse because the expectation then is like, well, we're going to get all these things. But whatever works and whatever brings people up to the door, because frankly, working with parents is a challenge of enormous proportions, even if it is about their own child. And, and the communities where we work, we have to be very culturally competent, very mindful of who we serve, and we're always constantly checking our own biases and our own stuff. But yes, it is, it's usually free. All our programming is free. Hi, my name is Sayed from uh, Women Business Development Council in Connecticut. I'm a business advisor and I was recently brought to the WBDC to help the childcare professionals in our area be better at their business, right? So uh, it's really interesting to see that uh, 
me being as a business advisor, I focus mostly on profitability, right? It's like, yeah, you're, you, you love your children and everything, but just talk to me about business. And I talk about automatization. I talk about business skills. I talk about all these, but really what I'm encountering, and especially after this conference, is that we also have to know, have a little bit of knowledge of professional development. So I think that I need to learn more about, uh, you know, early education, uh, what programs are better, what, uh, so like that they can actually, you know, talking about business acumen is like, maybe they have a better program. They can actually provide better quality of their program. They can charge more. But uh, in reality, when we talk, you know, yeah, the business side is more like, I'm not like coach. I'm more, more like advisor. An advisor is not like, I tell you what is best for this type of business, right? Coaching is more like, oh, what do you want to do? And let me help you. And you develop on your own. And advisory is more like, this is from A to C. This is the business model that we need to follow, right? So on the professional development, uh, what I'm thinking is sometimes I don't have a lot of restriction when I come as a business advisor, but they also tell me, and I tell them, this is the way that you do your service. I'm not going to tell you how you need to care for your kids. Maybe you want to be a daycare. Maybe you want to be an early education, right? It's like different type of offerings according to the people, the different type of providers that we, that I see. So really is like to become a better coach and based on your coaches that you guys have, what are the right or what is something else besides the business knowledge that your coaches must have? In this you mean, case, what, you know. what kinds of abilities, what kinds of competencies you yes. want to see in a coach? Empathy. <clears throat> um, empathy and active. Sorry. Sorry, people at home. Um, I would say empathy um, and active listening skills, right? And then also on the professional development side, I think coaches who also facilitate the training need to know how adult learners learn um, and the psychology and philosophies behind that. And I think those are the main things is really just being an active listener, um, having empathy and knowing how adults learners learn. And in addition to that is to learn who your audience is, who's sitting across and the way that you present, it does matter the way you speak. It matters in the way you engage. I train my, my people, my, all my staff has been trained on public speaking, on business acumen, on writing emails the right way, what to do, what not to do, how to not say, hey, do I need to do? I find it horrifying that an email begins with, hey, personally. That to me doesn't sound professional. So it is, hello, Maria, would you mind doing it? It's really learning all the, that matters, believe it or not, in the way you show up, the way you dress, when you're training, how you dress, how you move, all those things, besides obviously the listening skills, seek to understand, engage. And, and in a way, they all have either childhood education training or psychology training. So I try to leverage <coughs> their own training to look at very specific things on this is some things that you can transfer in your training relationships. And even in the coaching, it's literally sitting with them and begin, we are human, I'm a human, but you're also a professional. So how, we, how can I help elevate your business? How can I help elevate your knowledge? And so you feel even proud and not so overwhelmed. I mean, it's just really being real, but in terms of the business acumen, I think that's very important at every level. That it to me is something that keeps people in limit, in limit, in, it limits their professional development as a, as, a, as a professional in general. And it can derail careers too. So you, one needs to be very, and do what you say you're gonna do. Integrity. Commit, integrity. Tell them I'm gonna follow up with you on Thursday and you follow up with them on Thursday. And when I hear that they didn't follow up with them on Thursday, it goes all over me as you go back and apologize and you follow up with them on Thursday or the next day, whatever it takes. It is that you have to model what you want to see in them too. Another question over here. Thank you. Right here. 
Sandy Maldonado with Washington. Thank you. First, I just thank you so much for um, sharing um, all of your learnings. And I just wanted to add a little bit of perspective. We support uh, Coach Cadre in the state of Washington with six community-based um, organizations. And we really do that in partnership. I agree with you that there's gotta be strong relationship all throughout. Um, but I wanted to offer a little bit of um, perspective to the coaching. Coaching is not just fluff. And I, and I understand that this is new. And again, um, to your point, ma'am, earlier, we're, we're kind of creating the pathway here. Um, it's hard to sign up for coaching classes in college for ECE. Um, so a lot of us are kind of writing that book as we go. Um, and I think one of the things that um, we have come to learn, um, first off, is being able to um, support the coach in having those conversations that tie to race equity. Because I want to say, especially in business, it is quick for us to jump into um, our own bias. And we, we don't want to do is perpetuate more racism and inequities in the way money flows in our society. Um, I'll speak for the state of Washington. Our data shows that we have a high percentage of BIPOC women in this business. Can you describe what BIPOC yes, is, please? Yes, it's Black Indigenous People of Color. Um, and so we have refugee communities um, in our area, migrant communities in our area, um, and Black and Latinx being uh, top. And so it just the importance of being able to coach for equity um, is necessary. We cannot perpetuate just a checkbox mentality around running a business. And so I just really wanted to highlight that and put that out for consideration as we build out. Um, the other thing that I've kind of come to learn is the need to understand not just adult learning theory, but also human change process. Period. A lot of our coaches were hired during an era of QRIS. Um, and there's tunnel vision on the pedagogical side, as you have mentioned, but broadening that and the shift and where specializations are needed um, is, is big consideration for a paradigm shift for the people that do this work. And we wanna honor them as well um, because they've been the supports for many providers along the way, many educators. Lastly, I just wanted to close with, there's a lot to say around cultural humility. Um, we have great partnership with um, our tribal partners um, and a lot of the tools um, don't resonate for many of our communities. Um, and so we've walked away from things like ERS and class, especially our tribal communities have said it's not fitting. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what that means for us. So there's a lot of reflection going on for me around cultural sensitivity and the way to have conversations with, um, I'll just speak, um, our refugees uh, uh, communities and um, our Hispanic communities where typically they're not handling the money situations at home and how that's a shift, especially for family and childcare providers. Um, and it can be done mm -hmm. and it has been done. Um, so I just wanted to create that there is depth of skills, <coughs> technical, yes, and a lot of soft skills that are called to the coaches. And I wanted to lift them up for that. Yeah. So thank you for the space. You're welcome. Thank you for, for um, bringing attention to again. Sorry, yeah. everybody. And, oh. um, thanks for bringing attention to that. I mean, at Maryland Family Network, we have an equity um, consultant that has looked at all of our trainings, our programs, and we really try to look at things through that equity lens. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. And part of our, our institution is we have diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of, a, it's an integral part of our training, our conversation. So that also has to be part of how we approach our, our training as coaches and our training as with childcare providers and other caregivers and parents and even faith-based organizations and other community organizations with whom we collaborate and work in many areas, definitely. I also wanted to mention in another initiative that I worked with looking deeply more at equity was 
time when people could handle their business. So one of the two of the centers that I worked with on an initiative was to bring the business to the center. Um, bring bring the gas company, bring the electric company, bring the bankers, bring at a certain time when parents cannot get to to these places because basically they're not open on Saturday when they can do those businesses. Um, but if they could come for an hour or 90 minutes so they can handle the shutoff notice, so they can take care of their banking. So it, um, I, I had planted the seed and lo and behold, about three years later, the provider came back to me and now they have this thing going that I missed, but it brings those representatives to the center for so p parents can handle their business or at least get that information. So taking a deeper look into what equity is, 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 is not just race, it's, it's not culture, but looking at other um, barriers or roadblocks that prevents the success of, of, of any and all people. So um, after doing that, I was kind of happy there that I planted that seed for those two sites. So um, just taking that deeper look for providers and families as well. Um, I really wish this question had gone before that very thoughtful, provocative question, but this question is more about logistics and money. Um, you know, Kim, your slide on the how challenges impact, right, the business. Um, have you guys been able, and for those of you who don't remember, I paid extra attention here, but it was a turnover, vacancies, low compensation. Like, have you guys been able to quantify the, co the business costs for people? Is that part of your conversation? Because we have started those conversations, but have not figured out the secret sauce to that. I'm just curious if y'all have. Like, In our what PD, we are now beginning to take a look at that um, since the pandemic. We're taking a real closer look at, at that information and having a discussion and helping providers to, to see yeah. the rises and falls. And I can speak for myself. Um, that's the conversation I'm beginning to have thanks to my colleagues over there that I keep pointing to, <laughs> um, Amy and Mary, who've been doing it for a while. And now I'm, I'm learning that process to be able to share that information with my managers and also in discussions that we have during our professional development training. So we're starting up as a coach to be able to share that information. And we share in, in the sense of, we share what's going on in the US. We share what's going on in our own community and, how, and literally how many childcare homes have closed in the last so many years because of different reasons. And of course the pandemic becomes the worst of the worst. And so in part of our messaging, is about the cost or it's about the money you are not getting because of certain things and how the importance more than ever of sustainability. And this is what's gonna take you there. And with their input, we also know that there are some things that they must do to get there. So it's always a general conversation. We don't talk about specifics, you know, if you don't hire this, you because we, we don't wanna get in there yet unless we do the individual coaching and then we can get more into the weeds with the details. I think the question, the, the root of the question is really from like, uh, and you kind of alluded to it, Maria, that the, the trouble like keeping people in the program and keeping people coming attendance, like ongoing attendance. And so that's one of the things we thought about in order to say, you know, here's what this, like, you know, this, this is a value to you and here's what it looks like. And for your business, your area. So yeah, I, I think it, they're specific. I mean, we can all do the general piece yeah. within the specifics, I think, or is like, is there something in there that would resonate? Oh, broadly? well, we also have a program that I didn't mention, which we are, we have been doing in the last year and a half is a, we have the QRS, the, the star system, one, two, three, and we partner with the national Family, National Association of Family Child Care, NAFCC, to accredit women from two stars to three stars. And in that particular one, 
we told them, this is what you're earning now, this is what you're getting, and this is what you will get when you get your accreditation from NAFCC, and this is how much you're gonna make after you get accredited. And so far, hopefully we will have about 21 of them get accredited this year. And that's, I think, a pretty big number for a small city like Tulsa. So it's, we're really proud of that. But it has been a challenge in, at many levels because it's a self-study. And sometimes self-study things just don't work so well unless you're really driven. And so we, we had to do monthly meetings, milestones. Of how are you doing? How are you doing here? And that's part of the coaching, not being, not tormenting people, but truly keeping that in mind. Remember how much you're going to get when you get your accreditation. I think that's the biggest struggle for my business coaches, our business coaches, is really how do we get the 60 <clears throat> providers to come every single yes. time? I'm investing so much of my time and energy doing the research and, and providing the resources. And why aren't they coming? Or why can't they use that child care management system the way I need them to use that child care management system? Can't they just do it? Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, we hear it all the time. And bottom line is this is a voluntary thing um, and we have to be patient and we just we have to make the professional development so interesting that they can't help not go right so you know one of the professional development trainings that we just did is all about empowerment and 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 leadership our child care providers are all female so we do not have any male child care providers in this cohort so when i say female empowerment i'm i'm speaking because of that but we brought in entrepreneurs and um, female leaders and had them speak about what they wish they would have known when they were starting a business, like really those business foundational pieces. Um, we had one provider or one professional um, who was absolutely outstanding um, talk about an entrepreneurial mindset. And this is exactly how we are going to start our session for Boost 2.0 is developing that entrepreneurial mindset. What does that mean? Right. Um, and having them find a mission statement. So giving them those pieces. And since we did that class, they feel that it, everything is valuable. It's not just taxes, right? It's not just budgeting. It is something that is emotional. Yes. Um, and I think that if you can tag into that, then you'll you'll get that. Child care management system. Um, <laughs> the lessons learned there is, is to really have expectations and action steps for the provider to be able to do and follow up with. Um, so that's one of the lessons learned. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And one that we're still learning. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm one of the people Kim keeps pointing to, Mary Graham. And um, one thing that Kim didn't mention, the reason they're working with provider who are star two in Pennsylvania is at star three, the, re, the tiered reimbursement really kicks in. It really makes a significant amount of change in your financial, out, you know, your revenue. And it's not just 93 cents. Or, it's like, it is significant. And once providers can see that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll often say, I mean, we'll, we'll ask real life questions like uh, during human resources. So why don't you pay your staff a break? I can't afford to. Well, let's look at how much it costs to replace that staff and go over that and really do real life experiences. I mean, part of being, I think part of our success is Kim was a provider. She was a director. I'm a director. We talk about, I talk about the errors, the the mistakes I always made, continue to make. And oh, this is why we've refined the system. And, you know, when you give people realistic solutions to have a small win, it's just like working with children. They want to succeed. Providers don't want to wake up in the morning and underpay their staff. They can't pay staff more because they're not getting more. They can't get more unless they go up in quality. So it's a vicious cycle. And sometimes it's also saying to them, you got to fight the system. You have to advocate for yourself, that empowerment. In Pennsylvania, we have a market rate system survey. Amy and I will say, so how do you set your rates, your tuition? 
Oh, I, pay, I, I, I charge my private pay families, but the state pays me. Okay, they're gonna pay you what, you know, do you understand how vicious that cycle is? You have to talk about what it costs you. So I think, you know, I don't know that, you know, Kim was working with the programs. We're not having difficulty in our business trainings. People will show up when you give them simple methods to succeed. Um, and and see the reward for succeeding. And that's why I am an early learning specialist and not in a business specialist <laughs> and taking a professional development training um, with a business mindset. So thank you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, we also have, we have a waiting list actually every time we have this series that I described, which is great. It's a good problem to have. I wish that would go, the same group would go through it, but we decided to go whoever RSVPs for particular needs. You know, I need this, I don't need that. But we may be, we're starting probably some new programs that are more tailored to specific things and see how it goes, you know, trial and error. I know that you guys originally, we were gonna do a breakout. I'm not sure we have enough time um, because of the questions. So um, I guess I, it, it, I would just say, I think it's very interesting with all the work that you all are doing and the questions that have come up in the plenary and the work that these, these three entities are doing around coaching and business coaching and projects that are popular popping up all over the country, um, you know, it's this big question in front of us, you know, how do we integrate business coaching? How do we, you know, leverage all the quality coaching that's out there? How do we leverage folks like the Women's Business Development Center in Connecticut and folks who have incredible expertise? We've talked to a lot of folks in Maryland, you know, that have partnerships with Women's Business Development Councils, et cetera. Like, how do we know to refer to those folks? How can we support um, the professional development, you know, I was in another session yesterday, we're talking about home ownership for family child care executives. Um, and, you know, so, and I turned to one of our colleagues on the Maryland Blues Project, I said, is that one of the questions we asked on our application? Yeah. We didn't even ask when folks applied to be part of Maryland Boost, we, we, you know, we had criteria, we knew we were working with family child care providers, welcoming folks uh, all languages, asking, you know, about their access to and comfort with technology. Um, didn't ask if they owned their own home and if home ownership was a financial goal that they had. So I think there are many, you know, and we have a project in Philadelphia as well, where there's a project to provide PD, like um, was raised in this question, to accountants and other financial experts who really know a lot about what they know and they don't understand the ECE business model. So that's supported with private foundation dollars. Again, we're very fortunate in Philadelphia to have a couple of large foundations that really focus on early child education. Rose has a question. It's less, it's less of a question and more of a comment. Um, so one of the things Mary touched on um, was asking providers exactly um, you know, what they're paying. And, and Mary touched on the fact of the market rate. And in, I'm from Rose Snyder from, sorry, Pennsylvania, AUIC. Um, and one of the things that we did in partnership with First Up was uh, we created um, trainings around the cost of care. And that's one of the things that I think is very important that um, when I go in to do coaching with um, programs on other things and we have this discussion, many don't understand what the actual cost of the care that they're providing. And without that information, why would we expect them to be business savvy if they don't understand what it costs for a seat? And so we did a, a huge, um, put a huge emphasis in Pennsylvania on uh, cost of quality training. And I, it's just a, an observation that I think is important to recognize. I love that. We actually have a training coming up with Amy um, in May about the cost of 
their care, a tuition reflection. What am I charging and is it enough, right? Because we have to start that conversation. And it is a and that it's a deeply personal conversation for family child care providers, right? So yeah, absolutely. That is so important. And I was just going to respond before I hand the mic to Lisa for the question. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. You, Shannon, one of the reasons that um, you know the the slides that um, Kim was sharing and part of the reason we want to talk about those challenges, which we have not yet quantified and which I agree would be powerfully, you know, even more powerful had they been or when we, if when we get to quantify them. But part of the reason we even create them and, and structure some of these slides this way was because we're looking for a way in for coaches to have these conversations, right? So it's just more of a, you know, um, a, a coach wants to come in and be responsive to the person at the site. And so if the person at the site is talking about, I'm worried about this teacher, I'm worried about this classroom, how can we, uh, yes, listen, address and pivot so that if the root of the problem actually is a financial one, we can start to address it. So part of it was like, let's reframe some of the problems that we see constantly that we think of as sort of systemic or quality related or programmatically related. Let's remember they have a fiscal basis and then we can help give folks like Kim who we see in real life says, I feel more comfortable talking about some of this stuff because there's just a, a wedge. Hi, thanks. I love the comment about the cost of care. Um, my background is CACFP, and one of the biggest things we have with home providers, especially, is recognizing they don't have to write a budget for CACFP in a home. A center side does. Their food cost is something that they don't even recognize how much they're spending on groceries. So being able to work that out together. And I did have another comment in terms of the training and consistent attendance, because we also do training. We have you know, that's been an issue in the past. One of the maybe interesting things we learned during COVID is that we still had to conduct our training. So we got pretty good at Zoom. So now being able to do like we're doing today, a hybrid can definitely give us the ability to bring in people who might not be able to physically make it into our sites to combine that. And then looking also the ability to Zoom train is going to give us the ability at times to train on time periods where we might not have had that ability before, nap times, where we would have people coming in in the evenings. Well, now they have a period of time during nap times that we can put into a Zoom training that they may be able to come and um, attend something like that a little bit easier. Oh. <laughs> Just a is a te technical question. What do you all use for your um, business trainings? Do you write them yourself? Or are you using the strengthening business practices that uh, quality assurance the federal government has written? What are you all using? So we use, a, oh, go ahead. we use a variety of training. So we will have subject matter experts conduct the training. So a tax consultant who does family child care taxes will come in and offer the training. Amy does some of our training and she is a subject matter expert on everything early childhood business related. Um, and then we also, we are also looking into business development training through all our kids. And for us is some experts, but then my staff, has taken information that it's already out there and puts it together in a way that could be a fun way of learning. Because that's the whole idea that the coaches become the subject matter experts in certain things. And really, we don't feel that we need to be complete experts on everything. We're a resource, we share information. If we don't know it, we'll get back with you, that kind of thing, because it is important for them to feel too that we don't have to be experts on something to be able to share. Exactly, exactly. Yes. And just to add, all of our training is approved by the Maryland Department of Education so that our providers will earn um, right. credit hours for that. Same right. for us. With our trainings, I think it has helped that it's it's been developed by a director in conjunction with Amy. I mean, I'm living it every day. I'm dealing with the same issues as they are. So being able to uh, identify and be empathetic with that is really important because, I mean, we are not tax experts, but we deal with taxes all the time. And the idea to get 
accountants and bookkeepers to be interested in learning. I mean, part of it is advocacy, saying, especially with family providers, saying you're the customer. Don't let the accountant set up your chart of accounts. You do not sell children. So there are no sales in, you know, in your profit and loss statement. I mean, we got profit and loss statements and that was like, well, what did, who did you sell? And, and the woman said, well, this is what they gave me. And it was, you know, she wasn't being ignorant. She was just saying, I don't understand this terminology. And I said, well, you don't have to use that. You tell them the terminology to use. I just wanted to give one more uh, maybe helpful tidbit is that in Wisconsin, we were able to get professional development for all of the onboarding to CMS. So if they were starting to do that process with ELV or ProCare or whoever they're using, we can actually give them registry credit for that. And that was a huge piece of like, if I'm gonna do this, at least I get an extra bonus of how to use that time that way. So just a thought for people who are developing things.